have about 10 minutes reserved for discussion. Um, Carly's got her hand sort of up. Sort of okay. So Carly can, can lead off with a question and answer period. And do we have everybody, almost everybody? Janine's coming up here. Okay, well, yep. well, this mostly relates, I don't know if it's ready. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. This mostly relates to the last talk, but I think Ben mentioned it as well. You, okay. you, anticip you mentioned anticipated infrastructure that would be with the, uh, associated with the gateway. Can you be more explicit? This is absolutely key for thinking about what will be going on in the future around the moon. So, yeah, one of the key aspects to come out of the workshop is to provide input as to what resources do you need to do the science. So, mass, power, volume, if those are the kind of resources you're talking about. Um, um, access, uh, communication. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So if you're talking about an infrastructure like <coughs> sub-satellites around the moon providing TDRIS around the moon type extension, then that's not on the cards. But the, gate, <laughs> the gateway acting as a comm relay, so you can design, for example, CubeSats only have to talk to the gateway. They don't have to talk. And the gateway can <coughs> store large volumes of data and send it back at a high rate. Yes, that's the kind of resources that, that, yet, that we are thinking about. And, and, up, and also up mass, we were expecting there to be hundreds of kilograms per SLS flight, a spare up mass to go to the gateway to take these instruments. So your instruments could be larger than you would typically design for, which might make life easier in designing them, in fact. What about data rates? Yeah, well, if the, if the gateway can store your data, you don't have to worry about the data rate. The data yeah. <laughs> uh, Jim's got a question. So just a general question. So uh, about uh, 10 days ago, JAXA announced that uh, uh, they were teaming with the United States to, uh, I think, to get uh, involved with Gateway and to be able to send uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese astronauts to the surface. Uh, and I'm wondering if um, the U.S. will be able to uh, partner with them to actually send some American astronauts to the surface. <laughs> ben, why don't you just stay here? <laughs> so where is he? Where's he gone? No, ah, um, hiding in plain sight. Um, so I think the answer to that is if JAXA are actually, I did not hear them announce that they were going to design and build a full-on human crewed lander. If they are, then I imagine, I mean, just like on ISS, there's the barter system between agencies which gets them seats. I imagine that if there is a lunar surface capability, then that would be part of the discussion on which people get to go down to the surface if they're using the gateway as the pathway to doing it. So I, I guess the more general question is, uh, I think everybody in this room would be tremendously excited about scientific capabilities of the gateway to get humans to the surface of the moon for sortie exploration. So what, let's do it. What's the question? Well, the question is who is, right now is no, no, no agency <coughs> claims to have the money to design a human scale lander. If they are, then the gateway is being designed that it could accommodate such a lander. Right now, that's not <coughs> NASA policy. If other agencies wish to design and build a human scale lander, that's great. And then multiple agencies would use it. So the so. United States has no plans to be able to utilize the gateway for scientific exploration of the moon with humans? Right now, with humans, no. It's being designed. If our national policy changes that we're allowed to go to the lunar surface with humans, it's being, allowed, it's being designed with that as a capability in mind. Current US space policy doesn't include humans to the lunar surface. Could a private company do it? An American company? Use the gateway? <coughs> SpaceX, Moonex? Theor um, theoretically, that would be a negotiation between that commercial entity and, and NASA, assuming they're sort of the anchor tenant to the gateway. Maybe that's the way to handle it. What, what can this group do? to try to change that policy. The obvious thing is, if you're putting something like a space station in lunar orbit, you know, I mean, we, we have an extremely <laughs> successful lunar reconnaissance orbiter, as uh, Noah pointed out, getting all kinds of data. Um, so, you know, it seems to me that a gateway, the major goal here is to facilitate getting humans to the surface. So, what do we need to do here as a group? I mean, we're all anxious to get back to the moon. You heard all the discussions yesterday, and back to the moon is not partially inhabiting 
a space station in orbit for a short period of time. It's getting to the surface of the moon. How can we help? <laughs> I'm, I'm curious what your answer is going to be. I mean, this that, is when you go to jail, bit. <laughs> not again. <laughs> I mean, I would say um, non civil servants, I believe, can write to their Congress people. And, I mean, what, what do you expect me to say, Jim? Okay, so I'm not going to tell you that, because right now the plan for the workshop isn't related to science by humans on the lunar surface. The, I mean, that could be another workshop, but to be clear, the purpose of the workshop that um, Jim just gave you the talk, other Jim just gave you the talk about, is the fact that the Deep Space Gateway will now will permit significant amount of science to be achieved, even if it, its reason for existing is not science. And part of that could be telerobotics. So you could come at this that way and say what science with telerobotics could we do that not only do we get science, but could that actually help by testing systems that gets us closer to being able to put people on the surface? Can I jump in here and say a yes. few things about, because having been on the um, presidential uh, transition team for NASA, we talked a lot about these issues. Um, and uh, the going back to the lunar surface um, was definitely one of those things um, that that we recommended um, to the administration and is being um, described and discussed uh, right now. Of course, we're waiting for a NASA administrator to implement a number of our recommendations we put forward. Uh, but as we heard from the vice president a, a week or so ago, we've heard hints from the president <coughs> that returning back to the surface of the moon is not verboten as it was um, in the last administration. So there's several options that I think in terms of looking at um, access to the lunar surface. So there is the U.S. building a lander, and I don't think that is out of the realm of possibility at this stage, international, and also commercial. Uh, we heard from Jeff Bezos and, and Blue Origin, uh, and he's gone public with this since transition, that he's very interested in adapting the new Glenn vehicle to be a lunar lander. So there are multiple opportunities for accessibility to the lunar surface. Um, I do agree with, with what Jim said and others, though. The gateway is the place to dock a reusable lander um, to have access for multiple sorties on the lunar surface. Let me just okay. um, add, just follow up a little bit on that. Uh, there are um, uh, other advisory groups or other inputs, you know, the League obviously is the, the one that comes to mind most, but, uh, you know, the Planetary Advisory Committee, there, there are, f there are um, uh, established processes by which uh, input can be provided, and so uh, that, that might be something you want to pursue as well. All right. These are not, these are not unknown. It's not that far fetched to think of a, a, a commercial group doing it. They're already planning a number of landers to the lunar surface within the next five years. It's a, it's a big leap from a small lander to a human being. Well, it's true, but we've done it before. Good. We're going to go Clive. Uh, next. I, I had oh, next. You, you go for it. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry for changing and the subject um, to something probably just as controversial uh, planetary protection. So we saw it in the presentation this morning a clear statement that said, you know, robotic and humans shall not basically interfere with special regions on Mars. Subsurface ice is considered a special region, yet there is tremendous interest by SpaceX and others for potentially mining that subsurface ice. So what do you see happening between the statement you have on your chart and um, a U.S. Or, or commercial lander going to say, oh, uh, you know, 50 degrees north latitude and drilling into that ice. Okay, this is my opinion only as a biologist. <laughs> okay, so the, that's, so the National Academy series of studies looked at special regions, and scientifically they're very va valuable. And, of course, for other uses on the planet, they're very valuable as well. 
Um, as I said before, if you want to send humans, uh, if you want to avoid contamination, just don't send humans. We will contaminate when we go. So the question is, what is acceptable contamination? It doesn't mean you can't land near a special region or send in a, a robotic uh, driller of some sort um, to get the data that you want. Well, so this is much different than contaminating. This is basically drilling into it and potentially using that. That's right. We need to have the data first to find out what's down there. So I, I think you would agree even, you know, the, the most conservative scientists might say, you know, I'd, I'd like to know what's in there in the ISIS. Get me the science data first before I then set the regulatory standards. And those would be set by the scientific community internationally, okay. COSPAR. And I understand that there are people, say, in the commercial um, community who talk about drilling and mining who might not want that. Well, this is where we have to sit down and talk about the, who makes the requirements that fall under the Outer Space Treaty and have done that for decades, and the scientists are part of it, so stick around. There is no answer to your question as it exists now, except for if you don't want to contaminate, don't send people. Okay, we have, we're running low on time. I want to give Clive an opportunity. You may regret it, but Clive gets a chance to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have a question. So Clive. Right, um, Clive Neal, Notre Dame. Um, planetary protection. Um, the last planetary science subcommittee we focused on planetary protection and what came out of that because the planetary science advisory council is not formulated yet so we are moving forward there will be a workshop on on induced special regions on mars planetary protection thereof um in 29th of november to the first of december where I don't know yet, but we're working on it. But that was that was a, a last action item of the PSS and the planetary protection subcommittee. Induced by what? Pardon? Induced by what? By the presence of humans and or robots. Oh. So, and uh, that would include RSLs and other things. Mm -hmm. But um, but that that's something that is that is we're trying to formulate right now. But uh, th uh, to act on that last. Uh, finding from the PSS, so that that's moving forward, and uh, it'll be set up shortly. That, uh, I think so. What you can see is that the scientific community is standing up and saying, "Hey, we want to go there. We want to do the yep. good science." And so that's okay. That's how regulations and guidelines get made. But that's why I we join th forces with the Planetary Protection Subcommittee. Yeah. So that the other thing is that when you start to look at commercial <coughs> and going forward, we all need to sit in on. This yeah, together. I agree, absolutely. It can't. Um, and that's that's what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so, and so that's moving forward. For the moon, planetary exploration—it's a big gap. Oh, understood. And that. I don't know what the science is that would help us decide how internationally the scientific community wants to make uh, make guidelines to suggest where on the moon we should have sensitive areas or well, there is are everything there are wide again, open. There are again some some. Guidelines with regards to the Apollo sites and all, right. all landing sites, but uh, they're guidelines. Right. Um, the other thing is that League in 2011 was asked to do an, a, a, a SAT on L2, an L2 HAB, and the science that could be done from that that is available on our on our website. Um, so we've already already looked at that, um, but I want to ask about this gateway and what its orbit is going to be. Is it going to be at a Lagrange point? Is it going to be fixed so you have constant Look at one, uh, one, one okay. portion. I'm going to suggest, can you work? answer that very quickly? Yes, I can. And Brad, why don't you come on up? The answer is it can support multiple session. orbits and it can move in, but it can use the solar electric propulsion to move between orbits. So it might start off in NR, you know, a near rectilinear, but if, if, a, if science with a crew wants to <coughs> be in a particular orbit, it could move to that orbit for when the crew is there, and that includes going to an L2 halo and then going back. So the answer is it can support, it's being designed to support multiple or different orbits and it can move between them. All right. On that note, I'm going to thank the panel, the speakers.